a different one. Okay. okay. Our uh, next speaker before our break is Robert Ferentz from RAP Technologies, and he's going to talk to you about us to about uh, niobium and its role in catalysis. The answer to that last question was niobium. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob, I'm giving you a five-minute extra. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I expect I can use it. <laughs> Uh, while I'm getting this on, uh, you can stand up if you'd like. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good idea. Mm -hmm. I've been standing. I'll get some tea. So we'll use this. Actually, Madonna's uh, talk was <laughs> a good lead in for uh, something else I wanted to show you here. This happens to be a pelleted catalyst uh, for auto exhaust. But the point about it being that the niobium uh, is incorporated into the steel shell here to provide the thermal properties that's required when you have these kinds of uh, backfires and misfires in a cylinder when, you're, when you've got 1400, 1500 degrees centigrade of temperatures uh, arising here. I'm not going to use all of these, don't worry. <laughs> um, first of all, um, let me just give a brief uh, uh, explanation really, of, of who we are. RAF Technologies is a consulting firm that helps companies uh, establish competitive advantage, uh, mainly in organic uh, chemical producers and users. And we uh, do this by linking technologies and markets. Um, my colleague here, we're located in the Cleveland, Ohio area, by the way. My colleague, uh, Tadio Carnero, is the market development manager for Reference Metals Company in Pittsburgh. Reference Metals is the subsidiary of the Brazilian company that's the world's largest producer and technology leader in Niobium. They're headquartered in Sao Paulo. Uh, the mine and plant are near the uh, city of Arachá. Uh, and in terms of ownership, Moreira is a Brazilian-owned company, and Molycorp, uh, a, a segment of uh, Unocal, formerly Union Oil of California, is the other principal owner. Um, I'm going to focus on applications and, uh, let's say, more generally, technology here. But we're going to throw in a little geography, some history, and, and a few other things that maybe will bring uh, a little more meaning to uh, some aspects of, of these applications and catalysis. Um, here's a map of Brazil. If you don't know where Brazil is, in, it's in South America. Uh, Sao Paulo is here. You're probably more familiar with Rio de Janeiro. Um, it's roughly 400 miles north uh, from Sao Paulo is, is this community of Arachá. The other thing I'm going to do is try to answer a lot of the questions that I'm asked when I talk with people about niobium and its applications in catalysis. Um, a rough periodic table here. So, without all the, the numbers in detail, we see that niobium sits just to the left of, of molybdenum. Are you hearing, hearing me okay? Okay. Um, one of the points that I want to make in, in using this as a way of doing it is the chemistry of niobium, and in fact its catalysis, is a lot more like that of titanium, zirconium, and tantalum than it is of these four metals, and in particular vanadium, molybdenum, and tungsten. I'm going to use a lot of examples comparing niobium and tungsten later. But keep in, keep in mind that the, the, the chemistry and the catalysis is a lot more like these materials here. Some history. Next year we'll, we will be celebrating the bicentennial of the discovery of niobium. 1801, Charles Hatchett found uh, niobium, identified it as a separate element. Uh, he was examining some minerals from New England and as a result of that discovery, came named the element columbium. Okay? Now, uh, if you're my generation and you're a metallurgist in the US, you still use that word columbium. If you're anyplace else in the world, if you're a chemist um, and even a metallurgist in most other parts of the world, you will use another word, and that is, that is niobium. Um, this is Charles Hatchett. Uh, 1976, the Metal Society in London established the Charles Hatchett Award to reward 
um, uh, advances in, in the science of niobium use. Uh, since that time, every winner of the award has been a metallurgist. I think it's about time that a chemist show up here, and I think catalysis would be an excellent way of starting. Okay? Challenge for us. Challenge for us. Okay, discovery was 1801. The actual separation of, of, of a niobium material didn't occur until 1844, uh, when uh, the niobium pentoxide was separated from a tantalum sample. Here's where the name niobium came in. The Heinrich Rose um, thought that this was something different than what Mr. Hatchet had found, and now named this niobium after Niobe, who was the daughter of Tantalus. <laughs> Go back to the periodic table. <laughs> Tantalum's here, the relationship to, uh, to niobium. Uh, you'll also notice that it took another 100 years or so before official name was decided where the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry agreed that niobium was in fact the, the name of this material. There's a story that goes along with that that was told to me by one of my former professors, which uh, goes back a few years. Um, the IUPAC was meeting in Paris. The decision on the name of this element was to be decided. Um, the Europeans were generally in favor of the word niobium, the Americans, uh, Colombian. The American delegation got on the boat to go to Paris ran into a storm on the Atlantic, were delayed on their arrival in Paris. By that time, the vote had been conducted, and they lost. Okay. <laughs> Moving to um, Arachá in Brazil, there are basically five operations that occur there. First is the mining. Secondly is the transport of that ore to a processing facility. Then the concentration of the ore. Calcination, which is generally done to remove impurities and the conversion to products. The ore contains, on average, about 2.5% niobium pentoxide. I forgot that one upside down. <laughs> it does to me. <laughs> so I lose my orientation. Uh, this, is, this is the main pit. Uh, these steps, uh, to give you some idea of, of what the elevation is here, each one of those steps is about 25 feet high. This is done all with front end loading. There is no blasting done at all in this facility. Front end loaders and trucks. Uh, the material is carried from here down this road to a, to a, a building uh, that's, a, that's just off of the picture here. And it's loaded onto a conveyor belt, which then carries the ore roughly two miles uh, across the countryside. This is not Amazon Brazil. This is actually a relatively high elevation and, and fairly dry. But here's, here's the conveyor belt. It gives you some idea of the, uh, the topography of the area. Uh, after that two-mile trek, the ore arrives at this processing facility where it's put into silos. And then in this building, that 2.5% niobium oxide ore is, goes through a series of processing, flotation being one of the principal ones. Um, basically, you, you have a box. Uh, you uh, put the ore, the slurry, in water, uh, add some detergents and surfactants, and blow air up through it, through the bottom. Uh, the air bubbles attach to the small particles and lift them to the top, in which they overflow. A uh, fairly simple operation, but a, a surprising lot of science in it as well. Uh, as I said, this goes through a calcination process. And from that calcined material, there are a number of commercial products that are derived. Uh, about 85% of the calcine goes into the production of ferroniobium. Okay, this is used for microalloyed steels, the heat resistant steel that we saw in the application of uh, the, the uh, catalytic converter, some corrosion resistant materials. Uh, these alloys are then uh, used in super alloys which go into things like uh, aircraft engine components and uh, electric power generation turbines where you're operating at high temperatures in corrosive environments. Uh, niobium metal a principal application for it is in superconducting magnets for magnetic resonance imaging uh, equipment. Uh, and there are some high purity oxides here, lithium, uh, that go into lithium niobate and optical glasses for uh, uh, things like, like lasers. Um, I put this one in here because it's, um, there is a commercial application for things that you play with in your chemistry lab, and in some cases in the basement of your house when your mother's not watching. Uh, many of you have probably run thermite reactions. Great fun. Sparks all over the place. 
This is done on a commercial scale, and it's done not only for niobium. It's referred to generally as an alumino, alumino, aluminothermic reaction, I'll get it out, um, where basically you're transferring oxygens uh, from niobium, in this case, to aluminum. Uh, this got so hot that you developed a liquid, a molten uh, iron niobium alloy. Uh, alumina is a light material that floats to the top of that, uh, and you generate large quantities of heat. Um, once this material cools, you can then crack off the slag and, and further process. <laughs> and just one, uh, one quick picture here of a, uh, a ferro-niobium operation. This is relatively small scale. Uh, if you look at some of the ferro-silicon, ferro-manganese -mang operations, they are huge. Um, and you can see the, the materials are mixed here. They're ignited usually using something like sodium chlorate or boron peroxide. And uh, this, is, this is actually a dust collection bin here uh, because of the heat and, and the evolution of the materials up through that stack. The actual uses of niobium and catalysis have been rather limited. While the applications in, in um, steel industry have, have been there for a number of years, catalysis is really just, just coming along. If we look at the number of publications, for this period, 20 year period, we saw a total of 416 uh, um, scientific articles and patents. Um, this period, another 10 years, uh, 444. 1998 alone, we're running somewhere between 400 and 500 per year. Uh, and that number is increasing as well. So there's a lot of information about niobium, niobium that's been coming available that wasn't there. In what kinds of reactions or is this occurring? Selective oxidation is a big one. But you can see there are, there are a whole variety of things here where niobium has been used and, and, and maybe I should say has been evaluated um, for, for a number of different types of reactions, including some photo and electrochemistry. Um, over the last five years or so, this area of polymerization has grown very rapidly with metallocene catalysts, single site catalysts for, for olefin polymerization. Uh, niobium is mentioned quite frequently there. What's used in catalysis? There are three principal materials. The first is, is the niobium pentoxide hydrate, um, otherwise referred to as niobic acid. Okay? Uh, this is a developmental material. Uh, CBMM does make it available. Uh, niobium pentoxide is, a, is uh, what's, what's showing up here is actually the high purity metallurgical grade. And I'll, I'll show you some data on that in a minute. Um, being used primarily as a support material. And then we've got some niobium oxalate complexes. A few years ago, we were, uh, this was the acid form, uh, have gone to an ammonium form. And that again is a, a developmental uh, material. Let's talk a little bit about the hydrate. General composition about 80 percent, 80 percent niobium pentoxide, some minor components, tantalum, uh, some chlorine here, and some silicon. One of the difficulties that folks like yourselves in investigating niobium and, and putting it into uh, uh, catalyst formulations is uh, the common materials, uh, molybdenum, tungsten, um, um, vanadium. Uh, for example, the ammonium salts are highly soluble in water. Uh, ammonium van or, uh, ammonium uh, niobate is insoluble. Um, the, this hydrate is insoluble. Now, one of the attractive features about this material is it does have a high surface area. The properties were actually discovered by Professor Tanabe at uh, Hokkaido University back in the early 80s. Um, this hydrate is a solid acid has uh, equivalency to roughly 70% sulfuric acid. It's an, an isopolyacid or falling into the class of the polyoxide metallates. Uh, generally, this composition with some variation. Uh, one of the difficulties is that it loses water above 300 C. As you raise the temperature, the acidity declines and the surface area declines. If you're operating, however, in an environment in which their water is either part of the feedstock or one of the products, uh, you can actually do, do very nicely. And here's an example, of, again, out of uh, Tanabe's work, um, where the hydration of ethylene, um, 
that where, where the niobium pentoxide has been uh, calcined at 300 C. Uh, the activity is actually higher than that of the solid phosphoric acid catalysts that are used commercially. Uh, there's no deactivation over time, uh, partly because you're continuing to, to put water in the system, and then your selectivity is also high. You do have some small amounts of byproduct. When you calcine to 500, or if in your operating conditions you get up to 500 C, you're going to lose activity. The second material that I mentioned was actually the, uh, the, the metallurgical grade material, high purity. Uh, and compared to a lot of metallurgical grade oxides, this is a high purity material. Uh, 99, minimum 99% NB205, uh, some minimal uh, loss of ignition, uh, some water in there. Uh, tantalum composition only about 2,000 ppm. Again, insoluble in water. There seems to be a lot of interest in this material as a support, even though the surface area is relatively low. Only in the range of about one. 1 to 5 ppm, uh, some variation in batch. Let's move on to supported catalysts. When you look at the early literature, uh, you wonder why people even bothered. Uh, because these were the three kinds of materials that were being used to prepare them. These are, not, these are all water sensitive. Uh, they're not easy to work with. Um, and, but that's where the early work was done. As I mentioned, the, the ammonium niobates are not soluble. There is a potassium niobate that has some high solubility. Nobody wants to use it because of all the potassium. Um, so what's evolved from this are these oxalate complexes, initially the, the niobium oxalate, um, and then subsequently the, uh, the ammonium salt. Well, so let's start here. Um, nominally, and, and in the older literature, you'll actually see this formula written. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, so Raman uh, spectra are actually suggesting you have two oxalates uh, and, and an oxygen here uh, bound to the <coughs> Um Now, I, a, a lot of this work has been done by uh, Professor Ismail Wax at Lehigh University. And I'm going to refer, uh, most of the things I'm going to refer to from here on out are actually his work. Um, Wax sees two ionic species in aqueous solution. One is this uh, complex, and these are, these are ionic. Uh, one is this complex with three oxalate units, the other one is two uh, with some, some water here. Uh, and the thing that occurs is that as the pH goes up, and we're not, now we're talking about three, pH of three, you begin to see some hydrolysis. And the, uh, you, you begin to get some dimerization. Uh, in talking with folks in industry who have used this niobium oxalate process, uh, this is one of the problems that you will encounter is that as that uh, uh, oxalate solution sits, uh, you begin to get some hydrolysis, uh, minor changes in pH, addition of other metal ions, which create a pH change, will begin to cause some hydrolysis here. You meant lower pH. I'm sorry? You, you meant lower pH, I thought you said three. No, and as pH goes up to about three, as pH is going up, you begin to get more hydrolysis. Oh. From and even lower values. From, from even lower values, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, again, this is some, some work of, of wax um, looking at the solubility. And you can see that there is a, a very rapid rise in solubility if you add niobium oxalate to aqueous oxalic acid solutions. So ultimately, uh, with something like a 0.8 uh, molar solution, you can be achieving uh, concentrations of about 30 weight percent. Uh, niobium oxide, but you've got to use oxalic acid solutions. The ammonium niobium oxalate really hasn't been very well characterized as of yet. Uh, we've seen two different formulas written for it. Uh, one, uh, ammonium hydrogen uh, acid forms here. Uh, the second one uh, suggesting there are actually three ammonium groups. The solubility is similar but not identical to the straight uh, acid form of the oxalate. And the attractive feature of, of both this and the predecessor were that in calcining, you, you get clean compositions. Yeah, you may have to scrub some CO2, you may have to scrub some ammonia, but you're not getting chlorine or, or other materials, and you're not leaving residual uh, uh, metal ions like potassium around. Um, there was some work that addressed some of these issues of um, hydrolysis and, and polymerization and precipitation. Um, and I can give you these references later. This was from some work from Asahi, one of the Asahi companies. 
a European patent uh, application, they actually uh, demonstrated four different approaches for enhancing the performance of a molybdenum, vanadium, niobium, tellurium selective oxidation catalyst. And you did it by basically filtering out any suspended niobium compounds. There were some other criteria that they found as being very important, uh, not only in being able to handle these solutions, but in, in the performance of the catalyst itself. The oxalic acid to niobium concentration was critical. They defined this as the, as the uh, alpha oxalic acid to niobium. This had to be one to four. Uh, the ammonia to niobium ratio was important. Had to be in the, in the range of zero to two. Uh, and again, no niobium compounds on dissolved or suspended. Once you've done an impregnation on a support, what do you have? Uh, some surface niobium five species. Niobium is very difficult to reduce. It's essentially plus five and it doesn't change. These are monooxide units. They're isolated NBO4 uh, and some polymerized at higher, uh, at higher loadings, uh, some polymerized NBO6. In contrast uh, with vanadium five, also monooxo, but there are VO, uh, VO04 uh, units in the structure. for a, just a, a visual. Six-fold coordinate, substantially polymerized uh, in, in this kind of a structure. This is what's referred to as the monooxo uh, structure here. Uh, Wax has summarized the, um, the performance of niobium in comparisons against binadium in an article that was published in Catalysis today. I think it was in the, in the March issue. The niobia surface species are primarily Lewis acids. Redox is not one of the attractive features. Uh, in contrast, the vanadia surface species are primarily redox sites and may have some minor surface activity associated with them. And in some of the work with methanol uh, adsorption uh, that he's done, we can see that again the acidity function of the niobia gives mainly uh, dimethyl, uh, dimethyl ether, which is uh, an acid function. The turnover frequency here is much less than the redox. Uh, with vanadium, which gives mainly formaldehyde. Uh, there's another factor uh, here, I think, that we need to look at, uh, is that the turnover, turnover frequency here with vanadium varied by three orders of magnitude. Uh, and in fact, the support, if we were talking 1%, 5% B2O5, the support had some significant effects, with zirconium being uh, giving much higher turnover frequencies than, than titanium and niobium and aluminum silica being way down on the list. In practice, um, the acidic surface sites of vanadium promote reactions, in, in this case over supported vanadium catalysts, that require dual surface redox acid sites. Uh, let me explain maybe a, a, a little more what that means. Niobium is not going to be a redox catalyst in and of itself. Okay? Um, it has acidity and some fairly strong acidity. In something like a selective oxidation reaction, uh, butane to maleic anhydride is one example, uh, you will get promotional effects from the niobium. Take the niobium out, your activity and your selectivity are going to drop, um, but it will provide that, that sort of promotion in, in those kinds of systems. And uh, Wax has uh, given a couple of examples here of uh, showing, showing this effect that if you put um, um, methanol over this system, you're going to get formaldehyde. By adding niobium, uh, there are no, uh, no beneficial or, or promotional effects of, of the acidic niobium. If you look at sulfur dioxide going to sulfur trioxide, you do get some contribution from both the acid sites of niobium and the vanadium sites. Butane to maleic anhydride, you're, you're going to see both an increase in activity and selectivity. And if you're looking at selective catalytic reduction of ammonia, or uh, ammonia in the nitrogen oxides going to nitrogen, uh, significant increases in inactivity here. So it has a function, uh, it's, uh, I'll call it a niche player in, in this area of catalysis. 
Just to wrap things up here, I would like to do some acknowledgments uh, to Reference Metals and CBMM, uh, to Professor Tanabe, because I'm reviewing, uh, reviewing a lot of his work, and Professor Wax for, for a lot of his. Uh, there have been a lot of other contributors to this area. I happen to pick those two to, to give you the summary. Um, let me tell you one other thing. If you know your history um, of uh, chemistry and know something about the uh, uh, Greek mythology, uh, you'll know that Tantalus was a, uh, a king in, in the, uh, the mythical uh, uh, Greek uh, life. Uh, Tantalus, uh, how, how shall I say this? Uh, Tantalus uh, angered the gods. Uh, he gave food that was destined for the gods to common people. Uh, this was not well received, and so Tantalus was condemned to a life of standing in water with a tree of fruit above him. And every time he bent over to drink, the water would recede, and every time he reached for the fruit to eat, the branches would rise. Our word tantalize derives from tantalus. Now, uh, Naomi was his daughter. She apparently was not very bright. But she didn't see the example of her father set. Uh, she also angered the gods. Naomi went to Leto, who was the, uh, uh, the wife of Zeus, and said, na 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 na, I have 14 children, you only have two. What kind of a goddess are you? Uh, Leto's two children, however, were Apollo and Adonis. Um, Leto said, okay, we'll take care of this. I'm going to send my two kids out. And they took their bows and arrows and killed the 14 children that Niobe had. Uh, Niobe was then turned into a rock who grieved forever and, and weeps to this day. My final slide will be lessons learned don't anger the gods, and I think there was an example here at the bottom. Uh, I may have gone a little too far in some of the things that I said because my printer quit working. <laughs> Questions? <clears throat> um, current consumption of niobium uh, in all applications uh, if I remember correctly, it's in a range of about 50 million pounds a year. 50 million, yeah, there, there about. World, worldwide, most of it goes into steel. Um, the mine at Arusha, at those consumption levels, the mine at Arusha has a 500-year supply. They've quit exploring because <laughs> there was no, no reason to spend any more money. The, uh, it's, it's significant deposits. Uh, the other thing I, I would say was uh, CBMM probably accounts for about 65, maybe 70 percent of the world's niobium production. Uh, there is another facility in Brazil and one in Canada. Uh, they make only ferro, ferro niobium. Uh, there's also some byproduct niobium that comes into the marketplace uh, for, through tantalum uh, production. Uh, and you have companies like uh, Herman C. Stark and uh, uh, Cabot Corporation. Uh, they're suppliers of, uh, of, of uh, byproduct niobium. Somebody was asking earlier was to ask, go ahead. Bill. What's, what's the price of uh, the only amount say? Uh, the current prices are nine dollars per pound NV205. Uh, that is relatively expensive. It's not platinum or palladium, but it is relatively expensive. Molybdenum trioxide, an example, is probably in the three to four dollar range. What's the melting point of the only dioxide? It's high. <laughs> I don't know. How high? Is it in the 2000 range, or? You suggest I'm, it's I'm, close to uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty, so. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it is, Bill. I, I, I don't know, I don't know offhand. Um, and I'll, I'll go back to some of my previous experiences. Vanadium, uh, vanadium oxides and uh, molybdenum oxide uh, actually sublime. Uh, they, they, they don't melt. And my understanding is that the niobium pentoxide does not sublime and has a melting point much higher than those two. But I, I can I can forget I a number for it. Oxide melts in for all other, yeah. Is that, is that what it is? I, 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 my suspicion is this is my, my understanding is it's higher, but I can't give you a number. 450 Celsius. But not in both places. 450 Celsius. Yeah, that's pretty good. Vanadium melts in 1200 Fahrenheit. Becomes mobile. Becomes mobile at 1200 Fahrenheit? Yeah. I, I know when you. Where it kills 
traffic counts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know that uh, in terms of reducing the oxides, uh, vanadium pentoxide begins to reduce at about 600 degrees, and it's a multi-step process, and by the time you get to 800 degrees C, it's, it's down to vanadium-4. Niobium pentoxide, on the other hand, you begin to see some reduction at about 800 C, and it's not complete until you're up around 1300. You have shown uh, niobium can help on the reduction in some case. Do you have any examples to show niobium can help the oxidation in some case? Can, can niobium help oxidation? Yeah, I, I think the probably the most noticeable example is in the, the butane to malleic anhydride. Uh, it's not an oxidizing catalyst in itself, but it does accelerate. Uh, it does give you both higher activity and selectivity. And it's because of the acid functionality, uh, and there's something in the mechanism that's, that requires that, that acid functionality. Uh, that would be an example. Uh, let me mention also that uh, uh, my friend Madonna over here, and, and some of his colleagues at Union Carbide have a lot of publications on a molybdenum vanadium niobium system. Uh, it was designed originally for the dehydration of ethane to ethylene. Uh, and, and in that case, the niobium has some very positive effects. A lot of, lot of publications by, by the carbide folks in that area. Anything else? Can you talk uh, yeah, in terms of uh, niobium as a support, uh, you said, yeah, you can make it down to one to five square meter. That's getting in the range of attractiveness, but uh, the cost will be a big deterrent uh, at, uh, you know, close to 10 bucks or whatever after processing. Um, any any uh, thoughts uh, the cost of this material going to come down? Or maybe not in as pure a form or... So if you use it, uh, what is the balance? I, I didn't uh, catch that. What is the balance uh, in that ore? Well, the the nine dollar a pound is is for the metallurgical grade oxide, which is ninety nine percent. Ninety nine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the balance the balance of the material in the ore, if it's two and a half percent average content, uh -huh. uh, there are there's a, a fair amount of titanium containing materials, and and you have uh, typical silica, silicon, alumina uh, components in that uh, in, in the basic ore as well. Now, you know, it may be possible that uh, if you're going to do a concentration of 60% and maybe a calcination to get rid of some of the impurities, it may be possible that that, that calcined material with a 60%, roughly 60% NB205, is probably also fairly low surface, and it may be that the, the other 40% may be innocuous for your kinds of reactions. I don't, don't know that for a fact, and I don't know anybody who's ever looked at it. One example you give is uh, dehydration of the Meslon DME, and uh, you have to put that the niobium oxide. I think it really means the hydrate, right? The yeah, for for the uh, uh, acid. the hydration of ethylene to ethanol. No, the methanol no. to DME. That's the one example. Oh, 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 okay. The methanol to dimethyl ether. Right. Uh, no, that that was actually a uh, a, a niobium a supported niobium oxide catalyst. Okay, some, something else on niobium oxide on most, most Niobium oxide on, on an alumina or on a titanium, something like that. And, and again, there are support effects here. The titanium and, and the alumina will give you somewhat different performance. One, one more after. Uh, from CBMM, you will get a powdered form. Uh, you might want to talk to some of your cattle suppliers. Uh, they may have it in extruded forms. I know there's some people that have been working on it. Next, you need our customer back here. <laughs> 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 our cookies are getting cold. Oh, quickly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, commercial niobium uses in catalyst, you mentioned one butane to malic anhydride. Is that. Uh, just the academic study, or is that commercial? The, the and butane, uh, any other that are significant commercial use? The uh, back in the 80s, uh, Sumatoma Chemical was using a niobium catalyst to prepare a, a hexadiene uh, derivative uh, as an agricultural uh, uh, catalyst, or I'm sorry, as an agricultural intermediate. Uh, there have been some reports that Bayer 
uh, had a commercial material at one time. Uh, there are Mitsubishi, one of the Mitsubishi companies is uh, putting a pilot plant, I think it's supposed, supposedly on stream middle of this year for con conversion of, uh, I believe it's, I, I believe it is butane and malic anhydride if I remember rightly. It's got a niobium catalyst in it. Uh, I know of uh, four or five other development efforts where people are buying quantities for pilot plant or for semi-works uh, kinds of operations. Um, but in terms of large volume commodity applications for niobium at this point in time, I don't know of any. Okay. Let's thank our speaker and you. Thank you. Let's be back of our.